astounded. They were astounded, amazed. They were all amazed. All is emphasized, actually. Everybody was amazed. Everybody who ever had any dealings with Jesus was amazed, astounded. Those words actually carry the idea of a little bit of fear, disturbance. You don't confront Jesus without being a bit disturbed by that experience, but you're amazed, astounded. That's all throughout Mark's gospel. Chapter 2, verse 10, is he's healing a paralytic. We'll look at that next week. They were all amazed and glorified God, and they said, we've never seen anything like when in a storm, Jesus rebukes the wind. He says to the sea, be still, peace, be still. And the wind ceased. There was a dead calm. And the disciples were filled with great awe and said to each other, who is this? Even the wind and the sea obeyed him. After Jesus delivered a man possessed by a legion of demons, we read, everyone was amazed. When Jesus raised a dead 12-year-old girl to life, People were told were overcome with amazement. On another Sabbath, when he began to teach in the synagogue, the many who heard him were astounded. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea in a strong gale, then when he got into the boat and the wind ceased, they were utterly astounded. The people were astounded beyond measure, we read, when he made a deaf and a mute man to hear and speak. When the whole crowd saw him after he was transfigured on that Mount of Transfiguration, they were immediately overcome with awe. When Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, where many knew it would be to his death, they were amazed and they followed. Those who followed were afraid. When Jesus' wisdom and savvy was on display, when he answered about, you know, do we pay taxes to the emperor or not? And Jesus showed them a coin and said, give to God the things that are God and to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. They were utterly amazed at him. When he was on trial before Pilate, Pilate said to him, see how many charges they bring against you. And Jesus didn't make any reply. Pilate was amazed. What about the different hymns that use that? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And of course, the one we know so well, we do even hear in the public these days, amazing grace. How sweet the same. Amazing. Astounding. The woman of authority. The demon cries out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they all said, What is this? A new authority. He commands. Demons and they obey him. The demons knew who he was. They always seem to know who he is. Satan knows who he was. Even though the people don't yet really know, but they know. The demon uses Jesus' name and his identity to try to gain control over him. That was the understanding. Jesus of Nazareth, Holy One of God. And Jesus says, no, you cannot speak, you be silent. Notice again, it's plural. The demon uses the plural for himself, us, as if he's representing all of the satanic forces arrayed against Jesus. Jesus won't let him speak. Jesus rebukes him. That's actually a technical term. It was used by the rabbis with the idea of putting out the demons, keeping them away, exercising them. Jesus rebukes them. And they don't 
don't speak. Every time he looks, he does that. And they don't speak again. And they say, what is this? I knew it. Authority. They obeyed him, the demons, the satanic world. Falls before him. He has authority. Mark chooses that incident as the first one that he mentions here. That in Jesus' ministry. And it may be because he's showing that that's why Jesus really came to confront the evil one. Behind all the death, all the illness, all the sin in the world, there is this power of evil. And that's central to Jesus' ministry. In fact, when Matthew reports the same incident, he quotes Isaiah 53. Most of you know probably Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord has put on him the iniquity of us all. That's that whole idea of his bruises, his atonement, healing, certainly getting to the very core of our need, atonement for our sins, but implied in that is all that goes against us, all that follows that, the illness, the death, the venerable bead, this is a, 15, a Benedictine monk from about 700 said, it was appropriate since death first entered the world through Satan's envy that the healing medicine of salvation should first operate against him. The presence of the Savior is the torment of the devils, he said. Amazing, astounding, with authority. This Jesus, this great physician, he gets to uh, Peter's home, and there's his mother-in-law. By the way, a lot of us can't figure out why folks have to be single. Uh, obviously, Peter had a wife. He had a mother-in-law, so he had a wife. He was married. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and then the fever left her and she began to serve. He came to her. He took her by the hand. He lifted her up. There's a, there's a personalness there. There's an intimacy. That's Jesus. And she experienced healing. And she immediately began to serve. Where, where was the weakness from the, that the fever would leave you? Where, where was the... the the debilitation that would come from the illness that was gone instantly. And then a leper came up to him, begging him, kneeling, and said to him, if you choose, you can make him clean. And moved with compassion. Again, I just love that about our Lord. It's, it's implied there the tenderness towards Peter's mother-in-law. Here it is clearly spelled out, moved with pity, with compassion. Passion. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Now you got to understand how lepers were viewed, and I think most of you probably know that. In Leviticus, where it talks about lepers, you recognize the horror of that skin disease or whatever it was. How we don't really know whether it's modern day leprosy or something else, but it was very serious. The person who has the leprous disease, we read, shall wear torn clothes, and let the hair of his head be disheveled, and he shall cover his upper lip, and cry out, unclean, unclean, and he shall remain unclean, as long as he has the disease, he is unclean, and he shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And to touch him was provoking. And not only that, but when you touched him, you became unclean, not with the leprosy, but in a religious sense. You were unclean. That's the heart. But Jesus reaches out, touches him, a 
assuming his uncleanness upon himself, if you will, and for a moment. Now, the man said, if you're, if you choose, you can heal. Jesus says, I choose. And he healed him. And I thought about our prayers like that, our prayer for the sick. I'm praying for sick people. There's, there's a list of people that we're very concerned about. I don't always know if God's going to heal. I know he's able. That's the point. And that's this man knew that. If you're, if you're willing, I know you can heal. And Jesus says, I'm willing. I think that's the way we pray. Lord, I believe you can heal so-and-so. If it's your will. We have a hard time knowing exactly what God's will is. We know God's ultimate will is healing. There's no question about that. But in a particular case, we don't know what his will is. Um, my son's a widow. We lost our daughter. There was a lot of prayer. She had a very faithful and faithful sisters who prayed. I prayed. We prayed for her healing. Didn't happen. It's affected the family drastically, as you can imagine. Three boys without a mother. My son is a medical doctor without a lot of time to be home. We just don't know why. Uh, there's that, that well-known hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. It has a stanza which says, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind what seems to be a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. And we would say, most of the time healing comes. We're all witness to that. Whether we pray or not, his ultimate will is wholeness, but it may not be in that particular moment or that particular problem. He's amazing. He has the authority. He's the great healer. But Jesus next in our story here puts all of that in some perspective. While it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everybody's searching for you. He answered, no, we're going on to neighboring towns now so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that's what I came to do, to proclaim the message. People were looking for a miracle worker. They were looking for a healer. How good it would be to have him around. No, he said, that's not the reason I came. That's a sign of what I'm saying. But it's not the real reason I came to proclaim the message, the good news. The kingdom of God is here in my presence. Repent. Believe. Believe the good news. The time is fulfilled. That was how he came. That was his main reason. I think that puts a lot of things in perspective. The healing, that's part of it because it's indication of his victory over the effects of sin. Not the particular sin of the person. We never think that. You know, that man's sick because he sinned. That's not the point. The whole manner in which we live. That's produced the illness, the hurt, the death. And he came to defeat that. And he defeated with the good news of the gospel. And so that puts all of our ministry into perspective. I believe in healing services. From James, the, God, the uh, epistle of James, we read about it this morning. Or anyone who's sick, they should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Jesus got up early to pray. In, in what you read for the meditation, which, which I, I wanted to keep there through Epiphany, Pray without ceasing. That means always have God in your consciousness. If somebody's sick, surely you're going to involve him in that. And the best way to do it, call for the elders of the church to anoint in oil and pray. But keep things in perspective. When I studied healing services, I found that there were two types. 
Remember, they find that exercise power. Be healed. And then there were the time that exercise love. The Lord loves you. We love you. We're going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray for your healing. That's the direction I went. And then it talks about confessing your sins. I don't think that's just the person that's being prayed for. That's the people that are praying as well. It mentions Elijah. Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed. He was just like us. He was a sinner too. We need to pray for each other as we lay on hands. And maybe not confess our sins out loud. We're a little hesitant to do that, but at least to the Lord as we pray. But keeping things in perspective again. The healing, if it occurs physically, wonderful. It may not. But the love may convey the good news of the gospel. God loves you. Jesus died for you. However this comes out, you're going to be okay in the end. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I wonder how he could love me. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Save the wretch like me. 